Thank you very much. Uh, I originally prepared a uh, uh, speech starting ladies and gentlemen, but uh, <laughs> this is a much more friendly uh, setup. So uh, I would say uh, uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm Shigefumi Moria, director of the SGU Mathematics Subunit of Kyoto University. Uh, before starting the meeting, uh, let me very briefly uh, explain the background of this. Uh, the environment in education in Japan has been uh, rapidly changing due to the declining birth rates within Japan and uh, the effect of the so-called globalization uh, from outside. The Japanese government is trying to uh, the, the Japanese government has trying to uh, uh, oops, uh, to prepare Japanese universities for the for the change in the higher education for the next two uh, generation as a serious challenge. And this is how the top global university project with the Japanese acronym uh, SGU was started by the Japanese government. So in, in response, uh, Kyoto University through its uh, Japan Gateway Project, will lead the movement to promote uh, international cooperation with leading foreign universities, uh, not only to produce uh, the top-level research achievements, but also to foster the leaders of the next generation, ultimately, ultimately aiming at the new system of academic degrees. So today, it is a, a great pleasure to hold the SGU Mathematics kickoff meeting uh, to celebrate the first year of the Japan Gateway Project of Kyoto University. So I'm so grateful uh, to the eminent speakers, Professor Arwin Bortshausen from University of uh, Zurich, uh, Professor Min Hyung Kim uh, from University of Oxford, Professor uh, Herbert Koff from uh, University of Bonn, Professor Manfred Lyon uh, from uh, uh, Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz, Professor Gilles Pizier from Texas A&M University, and uh, Professor Thomas Schick uh, uh, from Georg August University of Göttingen, who have kindly agreed to participate and give talks. So we are all so anxious to listen to their talks. But uh, since I have to uh, to leave before the end of the meeting, let me thank the organizers, especially uh, the chair, Professor Takashi Kumagai, for the, 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 the wonderful organization, and uh, the supporting staff from uh, Mathematics Department, and RIMS, whose collaboration was indispensable for the, the meeting as well as the whole project. Thank you.
Okay, so we ask uh, Professor Namikawa to hear the first session. So before the talk, uh, I, will, I will briefly introduce Professor Manfred Rehn. He was born in Germany in 1963, so he is a little bit older than I. <laughs> only, only a half month, uh, no, no, only a half year, only a half year older than I. And he is a pro professor at Mainz from 2002. And Professor Manfred Rehn is an algebraic geometer. Uh, he is famous for the work on cohomology ring of Hilbert schemes. And his book with Heubrecht is also very uh, famous. The <coughs> book is now a standard text for the modular space, vector bundles. Uh, he will spend four months from this April as a SGU professor. And he's now learning Japanese. So, uh, uh, but but uh, uh, his talk today will be in English. <laughs> so let's start. His, his title is Rational Curves and Symplectic Manifolds. So please say yeah, that. You. I'm, I'm looking very much forward to being with you. And uh, this would be very inspiring to, uh, to, um, to be able to work here. And uh, I must say, I'm very grateful and thankful for this invitation. I mean, there are many Japanese mathematicians uh, whose work have influenced me deeply and profoundly. And without their work, I mean, I could have done nothing. I mean, and many of them are working here in, the, in, in Kyoto. I mean, I mean, I should. I mean, there's no need to point out Professor Fujiki, Professor. Mukai, but also Nakajima and Namikawa's work has influenced me profoundly. And uh, it's, I feel very honored to be here in the Today, I, I would like to, to speak about symplectic um, geometry. And uh, I'm aware that not everybody in the room is, a, is an algebraic geometer. So allow me to, to introduce the subject gently. And um, so what is this all about? So. Um, the first thing I need to introduce is the, is the notion of a holomorphic, holomorphic symplectic, holomorphic symplectic manifold. So by definition, this means that uh, x. So so x is a is a holomorphic. Sorry, x is a, is a complex manifold. And omega, a global holomorphic two-fold, and. Uh, to make it symplectic, we require that it's non-degenerate. So if we evaluate it on tangent vectors, this is supposed to give us an isomorphism into one forms, and uh, moreover, we require it to be closed. So, so this is a notion that uh, most of you will be well familiar with from, from classical analytic mechanics. And um, so what examples do we have? Well, the first example indeed is from Mechanics. So, so these are called the phase spaces. So, so um, we're talking now about. So I can speak also. Okay. okay. So um, this is um, these are phase uh, phase spaces. So this means I take M any any complex manifold, and then we can pass to its uh, cotension bundle. And of course, this cotension bundle. Then has a has a topological one form. Topological one form, say say lambda, and sometimes called the Liouville form. And then if we if we take omega to be the derivative, then obviously this is closed, and and uh, by a, by a local by a local calculation, it's easy to see that this is symplectic. And. Uh, this this uh, this example is is non-compact, and the, the first compact example can be obtained just by taking on a CN. We have uh, we have the standard form omega given by uh, dq1 uh, dq1 plus dqn uh, slash dpn, and then this form will be obviously invariant under any translation because it's just constant. So if we if we choose a lattice in uh, in C2n, then uh, we can we can form the quotient, and uh, and 
this form descends. Yeah, so this will be. Uh, so these are. This gives a class of examples that that uh, complex tori. Yeah, complex. Um, in some sense, um, we we don't really like both of these examples. Um, for the for the applications that one has in mind, namely the classification of uh, compact complex um, varieties with vanishing first churn class, um, there's a certain structure theorem, the Bogomolov uh, uh, decomposition theorem, which allows to decompose such spaces into into three types, namely tori, the so-called Calabi-Yau manifolds, and the hyperkähler ones, the ones that I'm really interested in. And for this, let me let me strengthen the definition. So we will say that uh, such, a, such a variety is an irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifold. If in addition to the, to, the, to the requirements that I imposed here, namely the existence of this form, I want uh, x to be compact. So this excludes this, uh, this example. I also want it to be uh, simply connected. This excludes this example. And I want it to be of Kähler type, which means that uh, it should admit a Kähler structure, even though this will not play a role during the discussion. And this is supposed to exclude other examples, which, which somehow with an unwanted behavior. And the second, uh, the second condition is a condition of the form. I want the form to be unique. So this means the space of holomorphic two forms is generated by omega. I mean, all these conditions can be rephrased in a, in a more differential geometric way by saying that the holonomy of this, uh, so if you, uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the symplectic group for an appropriate chosen uh, metric on, on that. Yeah, I should have said that, uh, of course, because of this symplectic structure here, the dimension of that spaces always have to be, to be even, so the real dimension is, is, is 4n. Four, four okay, so what, what examples do we have in that case? And uh, the first that comes to mind is, uh, is, the, uh, is, this, is, the, is the case 3 surface, and to be specific, let me, let me introduce the quartic case 3 surface. So what we do is we choose a polynomial, say homogeneous, in four variables of degree of degree uh, four, uh, and then we can take inside P three the complex projective space. We can we can look for the solutions um, of uh, of this equation, and if we choose F general generally or generically, then this will be a smooth surface, smooth simply connected surface, and uh, we do get a global holomorphic two-form, which can be made very explicit in this case in the following way. If I take, uh, if I take uh, this three-form, well, and now we alternate and if I divide by F, yeah, then you see that we have a three form on P3, which is well defined because of the because of the rec correct homogeneity of this. I mean, we have degree four and degree four both in denominator and and uh, numerator, and this has a simple pole along x. So if we if we take the residue along x of uh, this alpha, this will be holomorphic two form, and that's a very explicit description of of this K3 surface uh, of the of the holomorphic structure of that of that uh, surface. And then, uh, then uh, well, higher dimensional objects of this form have uh, for some time been thought to be non-existent. Uh, and the non-existence had actually been proved. Of course, uh, obviously, there's a mistake. Otherwise, I would not speak on the subject. And, and, uh, and uh, in German, we have this saying that, uh, um, that a person said, to be dead lives longer. Yeah? So, so here, the fact that somebody tried to disprove this now makes it very difficult actually to classify these beasts. Yeah? They are putting all strengths to, to defend themselves against classification. And the first example that, that, that was, was found is, is due to Fujiki. 
And Fujiki observed that if you take uh, two copies of a K3 surface and, and you model the symmetry action, that, uh, then uh, these things, uh, this, I mean, clearly, I mean, you, you can pull back the, symmetry, the symplectic form from here and the symplectic form from here, then we get the symplectic form which is symmetric. So if we, if we mod out the symmetry, this will descend. The problem is this, this is, is singular, but Fujiki observed that if you, if you desingularize this, then the, then, the, uh, then the symplectic form extends over the, over the desingularization. And this, and this example had then been, been generalized by, by Beauville, introducing the so-called Hilbert schemes. So the Hilbert schemes uh, can be thought of as, as moduli space of points on, on S, um, and, uh, but which are allowed to come together. And in case they come together, we, we remember additional information on the, on the, on the way these, uh, on, the, on the type, I mean, how these n tuples collide. So another way of thinking of this is by taking n copies of S, modding out the, the symmetry action, of course, the singularities here are uh, uh, a bit worse than the ones in this example, but uh, in some sense, it suffices to control what happens here in order to see what happens here, and then this will be a desingularization of, of the situa situation. Yeah? And an even further step was then taken by, by Mukai, and uh, Mukai showed that um, much more, I mean, in, in more general, we can, we can think of... Uh, so-called moduli spaces, moduli spaces of, uh, yeah, let me put uh, uh, algebraic vector bundles. Um, in fact, it's not sufficient because if we take algebraic vector bundles only, then uh, the corresponding moduli spaces will not, uh, will not be compact. So in order to compactify them, um, we, have to, we have to allow degenerate versions of these vector bundles, which means we have to allow coherent sheaves. And as I will come back later on, on, on this construction a little bit, let me, let me give a bit more detail here to, uh, to this. So, so, so we fix again uh, K3 surface S. And, and then uh, if we have an E, an algebraic vector bundle, vector bundle on S or an coherent sheaf, then we can we can collect the topological information about this vector bundle, meaning its rank and its churn classes in, uh, in, in one inhomogeneous element, the so-called Mukai vector, so which by definition is the churn character of E times some element that comes from the fr only from the surface, so the, square root, the formal square root of the, tot, of the tot genus. So this will be an element in the integral cohomology of the, of the K3 surface, yeah, this is the Mukai vector, and this encodes, as I said, encodes rank and churn classes. And now the point is that if we, if we take the set of all such vector bundles that have a fixed, fixed Mukai vector, <coughs> and we put on some stability conditions, let me allow me to ignore this issue of the stability now because it's, it's a bit technical and it's not really important for the, for, for, for the storyline, uh, then, uh, then, then this turns out to be a, a projective, projective, um, projective, projective, what? Projective irreducible holomorphic symplectic, symplectic manifold. So I will not speak about this con stability condition, but, I, but what I would like to, uh, to speak about is the, where the symplectic structure comes from in this case. So if we, if we take a, a point in this moduli space, then by definition it has a modular interpretation. So the point as an interpretation as a, as a bundle or sheaf, sheaf on, on the underlying surface S. And this modulized uh, interpretation can be used to describe the tension space 
I mean, of course, of course, here's, here, here this is compl completely, completely useless to talk about equations or anything like that. So we, so it's really important to have a to have a different interpretation of, of that space. But uh, the pension space, this can be interpreted in a monitored way as as, uh, as the extensions, as the self extensions of uh, of this of this sheaf with itself. So so a tangent vector corresponds to a sequence e. This type, so so this is very important in the sense that we can use the intrinsic geometry of of the of of the sheaf that represents the point. So, so this is geometry on S. This can be used to give an interpretation of the tangent space to the to to uh, to M. So in particular, if we want to talk about uh, about symplectic forms, it means that what we really need to do is we need to describe a, a skew-symmetric skew pairing. On, on X, well, <coughs> if, I, if, I, uh, if I write it down like this, then anyone in the, in the audience will probably just by reflex uh, say, well, there's a cup product get mapping this into X2. Yeah? So we will uh, go into X2, and uh, then here we have, uh, here we have the, 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 the trace map sending this to OX, sorry, OX. This is the point where, where it becomes important that we are on a K3 surface and not just on any other surface, because now we can evaluate this by integrating against, against the omega, which is, I mean, so this is a, can be read as an, as an, as an anti-holomorphic two form, so a form of type 0, 2, and this is a form of type 0, 2. So by smashing it and integrating, we get a map. And this map is a, is a non-degenerate pairing and this will, so this is the omega s on the surface, but uh, the, the, the total map can be read as the omega on the, on the moduli space. Yeah, so we have a very natural interpretation, and, and to verify that this all works out, that things are smooth, and it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's this major result here. And, and then, uh, well, there has been work by Heubrechts, O'Grady, um, and, and finally, I mean, uh, Yoshioka, who showed that, that uh, unfortunately, these, these, all these moduli spaces that we have produced here are, are again, deformation equivalent to the Hilbert scheme. And this is, this is uh, up to two, two exceptional examples of Grady. This is still the case. We have no, I mean, even since in the last 20 years, there have been not found any new topological types. Still, there can be New, new varieties, even if they are of the same topological type. What does it mean deformation equivalent? Um, if you have a, if you have a, if you have a family of of such varieties, so the underlying differential, uh, the infinity manifolds are all isomorphic, but the the, the complex structure varies. So, and what, it is possible to show that these these manifolds are actually not isomorphic; they're really different from the Hilbert schemes. But it's possible to produce one or perhaps even several families, and so that in the end you end up with the Hilbert schemes. So in that sense, they are deformation equivalent. Okay. So there's a, there's a, I said that, that all examples that we know um, are in some sense related to, uh, to, uh, to these uh, moduli of sheets on the three surfaces, and, but there has been for a long time one other family uh, which somehow for a long time looked a bit obscure. In, in, uh, and this was the, the family that was produced by Bouville and Donaghi. And, so, and, and this brings me back to, to the main subject of, uh, of, uh, of my talk. And so let me, let me introduce... Uh, so here, the main hero is the K3 surface, and everything takes place on the K3 surface. And I want to replace that now by a different actor, which is, which is the cubic fourfold. So, um, so enter cubic fourfolds. So let me let me fix now um, as before, but uh, now this is a, is a homogeneous polynomial of degree three, yeah? and we have six variables. So we because we get in uh, P five we get. Uh, let me call this Y in order to distinguish from anything what I had before. So again, this is the set of all, all solutions of um, this equation. 
And if we take f again very general, this will be smooth. And uh, there is some technical assumption that will be necessary, not in all places, but almost everywhere. So let it make very, I mean, from the beginning, that there should be no plane. Yeah? No plane should be contained in y. This can be by generic choice of f, this will be the case. So there will never be a two-dimensional complex space contained in y. So let's, let me, allow me to assume, assume this for the moment. So this, this is a surface of degree. <coughs> of degree three, and we call it uh, a cubic fourfold because uh, it's four-dimensional. And then uh, <clears throat> um, the interesting thing about this is that the, the Hodge diamond, so this is the collection of, uh, of, um, um, of Hodge numbers uh, of, this, uh, of this variety, takes the following shape. And uh, I, I want to draw your attention to, to, this, to this piece. I mean, it has, of course, this funny symmetry because of, uh, because of uh, Poincaré duality and Serre duality, which enforces this, this, uh, this type of picture here. But for us, particularly interesting is this, this one element here and how to get that. So let me imitate the construction that I wrote down for the K3 surface. So in the denominator, I have uh, something like minus 1 to the i, uh, x i uh, e x zero. Then I leave out this one e x five. But now you see that in order to get something well defined, I have to I have to balance this degree six thing on on top, and so I, I'm forced to take f squared in the denominator. Again, this will be a well defined meromorphic form. On the, projective, uh, on the projective five space, which has now a double pole on Y. So it, I cannot simply take the residue of this to get a holomorphic thing, but uh, by Griffith uh, described the procedure that uh, it's still possible uh, to, to, to get a form which is well defined on Y, and, but this form is no longer, this form is no longer, uh, uh, let, allow me to call it alpha, uh, this will be an, a holomo sorry, it will be a, a form of type three one on Y. Yeah, so it will be has three three holomorphic and one anti-holomorphic. Uh, the construction is basically the same as in the residue case. I mean, if you think of Y, and uh, so I, I need to define how this form integra integrates in against any submanifold. Well, extend this submanifold to something four-dimensional in, in a small neighborhood, and then you integrate this form against it, and then uh, this, uh, this will give you, I mean, this will def define this form alpha, yeah? But because it's a double pole, it will not be holomorphic. Okay, so, and this, 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 this is a unique section that is responsible for this one that occurs here. So what can we do with this, uh, with this, uh, sorry. So what can we do with this? So assume that we have the following situation. Assume that this is a family of curves, of smooth curves on Y parametrized by a base B. Yeah, so this is a family, family of smooth curves, smooth curves on Y parametrized by, by a, let's say a smooth base by a smooth space B. So here we have a total space, and for each point in the base, each closed point here, there will be a certain fiber over it, and this fiber will be, via this map, be embedded into Y, and if uh, the point B varies, we get a varying family of, of curves on, on Y. So what can we do in that case? I have, I have the pullback map from, from Y and I have the projection to B. If I take this form alpha, I can, it, I can pull it back to C and then I can integrate along the fibers. By integration along the fibers, of course, I will reduce the type. Instead of having the type 
three, one, via integration, one holomorphic, one anti-holomorphic direction will, will vanish, and the resulting form will be a two-zero form on y, on B. Yeah, so we get, uh, let me write it like this, we will get a form on B, which is obtained while pulling back alpha and then integrating, allow me to write it like that, we integrate along the fibers of B, and this will be a holomorphic two-form on any base B. So the lecture we take from, from this simple construction is that whenever we have a family of curves on Y, we will obtain uh, a holomorphic two-form on the base B. Q star alpha should be P star alpha. Ah, sorry, I, yes, yes. <laughs> no, this picture is wrong. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, right, okay. So, so this is, the, this is the generic phenomenon, and now let's start to see yet in detail how we can use this to produce symplectic manifolds. And uh, historically, the first case, the first case was obtained by Bouville and Donaghi. They looked at the following. I mean, they, uh, they investigated the so-called Fano variety. Of, uh, of Y, so by definition, you can think of this as being all the lines. So L is a, L is a projective line, isomorphic, abstractly isomorphic to B1C, and of being of degree one, and this sits in inside Y. Yeah. Of course, if it sits in Y, you can also think of this as sitting inside the P5. So this will be get a topology as as a subspace of the Grassmannian um, of two-dimensional subspaces in, in, in C6. Yeah, so this is the final variety of lines. It turns out that this thing is, uh, is uh, smooth, is smooth of dimension four. And via this procedure, it carries a symplectic structure which is non-degenerate. So, uh, so omega Fy. I mean, this of course is a, is a special case of that, of that, of that construction. Is, uh, is non degenerate. It's non degenerate. In fact, Bovillon and Danaghi showed more, namely, if, uh, if Y is of so called Pfaffian type. Let me just mention this for the moment, and I, I might come if I find time uh, on, on this question later on. So, if, if Y is of Pfaffian type, of Pfaffian type, then this uh, space turns out to be isomorphic. So here, of course, this is the, is the disappointing part because we are back to the, to the old examples. Turns out to be is isomorphic to the Hilbert scheme, second Hilbert scheme of, uh, of a surface, of a surface, of a K3 surface, uh, as a K3 surface. But still, I mean, as I said, I mean, this, this, uh, this, uh, this example is, is rather old and is a bit surprising because, uh, I mean, there's no K3 surface, apparently. There's no K3 surface showing up in, in, the, in, the, in the construction. Yeah? And, um, and then uh, for some time, not much happened in this, uh, in this direction. And then uh, the young and star at it uh, a bit closer. And they, uh, they, they try to generalize this in the, in the following way. They said, well, let's define uh, well, this is my notation now, is, but, uh, but basically all the results that are here are due to De Jong and Star. So, so uh, let's, let's define this as being the closure, closure in, uh, in the Hilbert scheme of Y of the open set um, of, the, uh, of the following set, um, namely uh, MDY0. These are uh, 
um, rational curves on y. So c is, is, is a rational curve, uh, smooth. So it's abstractly, it's abstractly isomorphic to the projective uh, one-dimensional projective space, but it's embedded in such a way that it has degree d. It's degree d. Yeah, so it's, it has a, is a kind of twisted, twisted embedding in, into this. So if uh, if you choose d equals one, you get this example. Yeah. So this is a higher dimensional case. A higher degree case, and uh, and then of course by the same procedure that I explained over there, we will get a, get a holomorphic two form, omega b, holomorphic two form, on uh, at least on the open part. Okay, and then uh, Bjorn and Star showed two things. The first was that among among, among others, uh, that uh, this form actually extends as a holomorphic form on any de-singularization of that space. So this might be singular. No, no one knows yeah, in general. This might be very singular. But they showed that if you, if you choose any smooth compactification of, uh, of that space, then uh, this holomorphic two-form will extend as a holomorphic two-form. The point is it's in general not symplectic. And, and uh, so what happens is the following. Um, if it's not symplectic, then we can measure failure to be symplectic by looking at the dimension of its cone. Or in the case of a symplectic form, we perhaps better should speak of its radical. Yeah? So we look at the dimension of the radical, and then they, then they found the following table, namely if the degree is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, say 8, then uh, we can look at the dimension of, uh, of the kernel of omega d e, uh, at a generic point. So that's that's generic calculation. Then they found the following numbers. And from now on it becomes too periodic. So how should we interpret these numbers? Oh, well, I should perhaps also give you the, the dimension of that space. Uh, yeah, it's, a bit, it's a bit strange table now, but... Uh, so here we have four, seven, ten. I, can, I, I assume you can guess the, the rules, yeah? It's, uh, it's 22, 25. And uh, so these are the dimensions of, uh, of that space. So how should we read this? If, if you, for example, take, take uh, d equals 2, then the moduli space will be seven-dimensional, no? But the, uh, but the form has a, has a rather large kernel of rank 3. Of course, it certainly cannot be symplectic anyway because the dimension is odd, yeah? But, uh, but we can measure precisely, or they can measure precisely the failure for this generically. And let me, let me explain why, what is the geometric reason for this failure. That's because it's easy to see. Well, let's do the following. So we assume d equals 2, and uh, I take in that space of uh, curves of degree 2, I take a point. So this point corresponds to a curve of degree 2. A curve of degree 2 is always a plane conic. So C in Y is a plane conic. So in particular, if I take the linear hull, so this is the, is the smallest linear subspace in the projective space that contains C, then this will be a plane. But this means conversely that if I take y and I intersect it with this plane, I mean, you remember that I imposed the condition that my y should not contain any plane. So this means this plane is not contained in y, or in other words, y, the intersection, is a, is a proper intersection. So this is a, is a hypersurface of degree 3. It intersects C, C therefore, in a, in, a, in a curve of degree 3. This curve of degree 3 contains C. So the curve obviously must break up into something of degree 2. Well, what is left is something of degree 1. Something of degree 1 is necessarily a line. So we have the curve C and a residual line L. In this way, we get a well-defined map from M2 of Y back into M1 of Y, sending a point that corresponds to this conic to the point corresponding to the residual line of that. 
conversely, so I mean, the picture of this is, well, I'm not sure, I, I, I find pictures helpful, but uh, so if I, this is very symbolic, yeah, so this is y of degree 3, and if I take, if I take the, the plane generated by c, then this plane will intersect the conic in, in one more line. Now, conversely, if you fix the line, how, how can I get a conic? Well, you take, simply take all planes that contain that line and just reverse the construction. So if I have a plane, this contains the line, I intersect it with y, then there will be a residual curve, which is a conic. So this means that, that this, actually this thing, the fibers are just given by all planes that contain the given line, and this turns out to be a P3. So here you see perfectly why, why, uh, why this form fails, because one can verify that the form on, on uh, here is a pullback of the form on, on there, and, and it clearly is, is trivial along the fibers of that vibration, so, uh, so the kernel of this will be three-dimensional. So, so if you see this, then, then the next interesting case will be, will be the case of, of cubics. And uh, so this, this paper is from, from 2004. And um, so we, we, <coughs> we looked at this uh, degree three case. And indeed, in that case, we, we found something interesting. So let, uh, let me speak on degree one. So degree three, and uh, here I, I I I want to give you uh, two two theorems, and then I, I want to explain part of um, part of this, and and uh, let me and then I will finish with some speculations. So so here this is joint work with a former student of mine who by coincidence has the same name, and and um, so Christian Lehn and uh, and. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, my standard collaborator, Christoph Sorger, and uh, my colleague, Tycho van Straten, uh, from Mainz. <coughs> so, so the first observation we made is that, and that was, uh, was a big surprise for us, and, and, uh, and this is not, not automatic. It requires... Um, Many many calculations. It, this is not. I mean, sometimes smoothness you get for free, but this smoothness is hard work. Yeah. So it turns out that this thing is smooth. Yeah, it's smooth projective. Dimension ten. And uh, and the second thing is so so uh, you see that that we should contract two dimensions. If, we, if, if there's any chance to make it symplectic, we should contract two dimensions. It turns out that there exists uh, an eight-dimensional irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifold, uh, Z, which uh, depends on Y. And there are also morphisms. Um, so from the space of cubics down to Z of Y. And and also an embedding of Y itself, which is quite surprising. And of course, this embedding has to be a Lagrangian embedding, but this is automatic given the topology of Y. Once you find an embedding, it automatically has to be Lagrangian. And uh, it turns out that this morphism actually has a very, very nice structure, namely, if we take the blow-up of, of this variety along that subspace, so here we take the blow-up of Y along that space, then it turns out that this factors over this, and this is a P2 bundle. A P2 as a fiber bundle with, with uh, complex projective spaces as fibers. Um, and, uh, well, to complement this is, uh, we have the following theorem. This is uh, in collaboration with Nick Eddington. And uh, here we show that, um, uh, first of all, this, this space, so if, if uh, Y is of Pfaffian type, of Pfaffian type, then, then Z of Y is birational to a Hilbert scheme 
L4 of S. And uh, there's another statement here, which I will perhaps postpone until I have a chance to introduce the notations for that. So this again means that, uh, I mean, any of these is, they are not, so by a theorem of Heubrecht's, if something is birational to a Hilbert scheme, then it's actually deformation equivalent to a Hilbert scheme. And if, um, well, anything else is certainly deformation equivalent to these ones. So our new family will be, again, deformation equivalent to Hilbert schemes. However, the family is new in the sense that um, it is a, it's a complete family. So we have, this is the first family of, of eight-dimensional irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifolds, which really sweep out the maximal possible deformation dimensions for holomorphic projective manifolds of this dimension. So there, of course, there are eight-dimensional Hilbert schemes, but they form a divisor in, in, uh, in, in that. And so that, that's the, in dimension four, we have now several co uh, constructions by, by many people, Ilyev um, Ranestad, um, uh, Manivel, uh, O'Grady, and so on. So we have many, many constructions of four-dimensional complete families, but this is the first eight-dimensional complete, complete family. So you said that you, you have, there's a lot not known about these um, IHSMs, but you know these the dimensions or structure of the deformation spaces? I mean, of course, we know, we, know, we know lots of things about the deformation space. Yeah? I mean, the deformation space, I mean, these things are, is, is, are well studied. I mean, in some sense, we know that there are uh, stuff out there, but it's, it's not easy to get precise constructions for them. Yeah? So it's, uh, and so, yeah. and, uh, and uh, so now I have 20 minutes left. So, I mean, I could speak about the geometry of this, but I could also speak about this fourth point, namely to relate that to the, um, to the um, symplectic structure and the derived category. Perhaps, perhaps I do the second thing and, and we'll leave out the geometry and we'll speak about the derived categories. Is that, is that okay or should I speak about the geometry? What do you prefer? It's a, now it's a choice. <laughs> we can take a vote. Um, um, now let me let me speak a little bit about the geometry first. And, uh, can I ask another question? Yep. You have this Pupkin type condition. Is it a restrictive condition or is it which condition? This Pupkin type, which now showed up twice. Okay. So no, okay. Let let me let me explain that first. Yeah. It's a. Uh, so Pfaffian, Pfaffian type is a, is a divisor in, in the in the in the modulized space, and and uh, so the idea the idea is, is this. So let's okay, let U be an abstract six-dimensional vector space, and then and then we then we can take lambda two of we take the projectivization of this, and we take the projectivization of its dual. And then inside here, this has a, I mean, so this means these are six by six skew-symmetric matrices. Um, then we can stratify that space by the rank of that matrix. Um, if the rank is, uh, is, is, is a generic degenerate, it means it's a, it's, it's a hypersurface. It's a, this is a hypersurface of degree three. So these are the Pfaffian, I mean, the, the skew-symmetric matrices of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of rank four. And then inside here we have we have rank two matrices, but this means exactly the Grassmannian. So here we have the Grassmannian of uh, oh no good. So this is the is two dimensional quotients of, uh, of of U, and on the other hand here we have exactly the same thing, just everything dual. Yeah? So here we can we can think of this as being two dimensional subspaces of of U or as two dimensional quotient spaces of of U star. And then let's say we, we take uh, let's say we, we take here a generic um, five-dimensional subspace being given by a six-dimensional subspace of uh, of lambda to u. Then if I if I pass to the to the orthogonal complement, I get something which is this is 15-dimensional. This will be this will be nine-dimensional, and then. Uh, then here we get some nine-dimensional vector space. Okay, so if I if I intersect these two, then I get a cubic hypersurface, and this is a hypersurface of Pfaffian type. In other words, a hypersurface of Pfaffian type, if its equation can be written as the Pfaffian 
of a six by six uh, stoichiometric uh, matrix. If this is possible, then it's of Pafian type. And, but you see also here that due to this construction, there will be this intersection. This is a P8, of course, not a P9, because we have a nine dimensional space. So projectivizing it will become P8. This one is eight dimensional. This is 14 dimensional. So you get a two dimensional, and this is a K3 surface. And this is the K3 surface that shows up in both ways. And now you have, you have I mean, you can imagine that there's something, I mean, pro holomorphic projective dualities that relate the two things, and you can do lots of geometry between these things. And, is there um, that without the condition, you get some exotic? Um, pardon? Is there hope that without the path in type condition, you get something exotic? Um, well, it depends on what you mean. It's exotic. It's definitely not Hilbert schemes. Yeah, but but still, still deformation. So the topology is the same as the one of underlying Hilbert schemes. So let me let me try to explain why, how this wire shows up in the in the construction. You know, why where does it come from? The point is this. I mean, if we, if, we have a, if we have a line, then it's a line. Nothing can happen to it if it degenerated. If you have a conic, you see immediately that this can degenerate in many ways. And in order to get something compact, you actually need to consider these things. If we, if we now uh, look at uh, it, uh, uh, whatever signs I draw, it's very difficult to read, right? So, so, so let's now talk about the degree three case. In, in the degree three case, the general object will be a so-called twisted cubic. And if it's smooth, it really looks like this if you draw a real picture for it. Yeah? But it can degenerate, and, but it can degenerate now in many, many different ways. And there's, there's one way, say, for example, it can, get, can break up into different components and, and, and so on and so on. But it can also degenerate in the following way, namely that somehow you, you flatten the curve until it lies is completely contained in the plane. Uh, then, uh, then you will get a singularity here. Now, if you check the the the, the cohomological, uh, I mean the the, the 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 Hilbert polynomial of this ob object, then the Hilbert polynomial of this one is three n plus one, and the whole Hilbert polynomial of this one is only three n. And in order to get the Hilbert polynomial correct, you have to add one more point. And if you do it in a flat way, I mean, if, you, if, if this is, I mean, let's say smooth yeah, or a continuous deformation yeah, to, to this one, then it, and then it requires a so-called embedded point. So, so the curve will be plain, but it, in some sense, the reduced curve will be plain, but there will be a non-reduced point. And the non-reduced structure is, is chosen in such a way that it sticks out. And there's a unique way of doing it inside a given P3. And so we get, we get these two types of curves. This one is the generic behavior, and these curves are called arithmetic cone Macaulay. Because if you take the cone, I mean, these are curves in P5. If you take the cone over them uh, in, 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 the, in C6, the affine cone over it, then this will produce singularities will, which at the origin are still arithmetic cone Macaulay. So they are sort of mild. And whereas these ones are really, really singular, they are, they are, not, Cohen, they are not even Cohen Macaulay, yeah? let alone arithmetic Cohen Macaulay. And now, so, if, uh, so the picture now is, is this. We have, the, we have here the, the, the manifold, I mean, the space of uh, this 10 dimensional space of cubic curves. So if I take any cubic curve here, the linear hull of this one, this is quite surprising, is uh, n not, not at all evident. The linear hull of this one, the linear hull of this one will be a plane, a three plane. So we get a well-defined map to the Grassmannian of three-dimensional subspaces in P5 by sending the curve to its linear hull. And uh, then uh, this map factors, we can take the Stein factorization, which is, uh, so this is a finite map turns out that it is finite 72 to 1. And the generic fiber is related to the root system of the, of the exceptional group E6. That's why there are 72. And then we can, we can take the desingularization of that space. 
and this factors and is a P2 bundle. And then inside here, I said this one is the generic behavior. This is the is the un, I mean the unexpected behavior. So here we have a divisor sitting of of the of the non corn Macaulay curves, and uh, under this P2 vibration, this uh, becomes a, a divisor in Z prime, and and uh, then we have this final contraction down to Z. So what happens on that step? The point is that on the on the way down to Z, it turns out that all information of, about the curve gets lost except for the, for the information about that point. What is the reason for this? I mean, the, I mean there are many I mean, ways how to, how to look at that. I mean, in, in particular, why, why this is, is this just, uh, is just, this just why? I mean, how do we get such a curve? Well, there's the following way. We, we choose why. And then we need to produce that that uh, that uh, that curve, and the only way to do this is is to choose a P3 down here, so this linear curve, in such a way that it does not intersect transversely at the tension space. So it should be contained in the tension space of uh, of the in the projective tension space of uh, of this of, at this point, and afterwards we choose a plane, uh, but this. But by this map, we get rid of the P2 bundle. What is the P2 bundle? Well, the P2 bundle simply is the choice of all possible P2s that, are, that, that go through this point and lie in between Y and P3. So having got rid of that P2 bundle, we have, we have only this left, and then the final contraction just forgets about this choice. And what is left is the, is the, point, is the point Y. So, so all these different fibers all these different curves that go through the same point, they are all mapped down to Y. There's a much better interpretation for this if we pass to the, if we pass to the derived category. And now I have seven minutes less, so let me, let me explain about, about that. So let me come back first to, to Mokai's example. Uh, construction. Why? Why? What is the what is the reason there? I mean, I mean, the, if if we take say say now we are back on on S yeah on a K three surface. Suppose I have two two coherent sheaves. I mean, I take two different ones, and all, otherwise you will not see which one is E and which one is E. Yeah? If I call them E and F, you will see which is which. So I have uh, I have the homomorphism from E to F. Then by cell duality, I can write this or let me let me write this more generally as as x i, then by cell duality, this is 2 minus i, f e, and then there's a shift, sorry, a twist coming in because I need to twist with the Korean. So this is, this is cell duality in general for an arbitrary surface. Now, if we're on a K3 surface, then of course omega s is, uh, is trivial, so I can get rid of this. If I rewrite this now in terms, instead of working on with coherent sheaves, I, I go to the derived category of, of coherent sheaves on the surface. So in some sense now E and F are allowed to be complexes. Also I write instead of X, I, I write HOM, and, but I allow F to be, to be, to be shifted in the, in the category. Then, uh, then this whole thing can be written as OM, and this two here becomes uh, just a shift. <laughs> So, so, the, so the point why all this works is that on S, the derived category has this fundamental property that the self functor, self -functor here is just shift. It's shift by two. So this is the crucial property that makes things work. Yeah? And, uh, and uh, so let's see what, what happens, uh, what is the situation about why? Certainly, Y has a, the canonical bundle is, uh, the anti-canonical bundle is positive, so the canonical bundle is very negative. So we do not have such a situation. But Kuznetsov um, um, analyzed this in the, following, in the following way. He said that the derived category of Y has a decomposition, a semi, so-called semi-orthogonal decomposition, decomposition uh, by the, in the following way. 
So these are these are the standard line. This is the standard line, a positive standard up the line bundle on, on Y that comes from its embedding, and this is the trivial bundle, and this is the negative twist. By definition, that category is, is consists of all objects in the derived category such that there are no morphisms from the right to the left. So in that sense, this is the right, it's the right orthogonal complement in the categorical sense of, uh, of this. Yeah? And now the, the key observation is that this thing um, behaves as if it were a derived category on a K3 surface, almost. Yeah? This, so this thing, AY, AY is a Calabi Yao 2 category. Calabi Yao 2 category, or two dimensional, two di it's better to say. Uh, uh, Category. So this means that we have we have exactly this behavior. So there's so the, I mean, but of course one has to distinguish between the self functor on the full category and the self functor on that subcategory. So this subcategory has its own self functor with the shift by two. And this means that objects in that category behave as if they were sheaves on a K3 surface. And this has the immediate consequence that X1 is dual to X1. That x and x two is dual to home, which is which is not the usual cell duality on y, and uh, this will be non-degenerate. So so uh, what what happens? Oh, now I erased the wrong blackboard. Uh, so so uh, of course the question is how to get in there. So we given starting with any projective, say she uh, Korean sheaf, in order to get there we have to do we have to start on the right hand side and do projections in the derived category. As so called left mutations, which takes an object and bring them into this category. And, and, uh, and this, summer, in some sense, if I now look again at my picture of, uh, of, uh, of this situation, and uh, here this, this P2 bundle, and, and here we have this final contractions, then it's actually you can, you can verify that this corresponds exactly to the projections, to the left mutations that take place in, the, in this situation. So, for example, in, uh, if you start with a, with a sheaf, with, sorry, with a curve which is arithmetically called Macaulay, then already some, this, this left mutation stuff stops one step earlier than in the other case. And, and, uh, and in each case, I mean, as usual, when you do a projection in, in linear space, you lose information. Yeah, if you just project something, you, you lose all the information that happens in the fiber. And the same, the same happens here. And, and this, this, this process of forgetting information is the one that takes the curve here. So this one really parameterizes curves. And, but this, in the end, is no longer a parameterization of curves, but of equivalence classes. And that process forgets exactly the same piece of information that you forget there. So in the end, we, are, we come back to the fact that the reason, the true reason for the appearance of the complex, the, the, of the symplectic structure, lies in the, in, in the existence of this, this Kuznetsov category here. And um, well, that's, that's what I wanted to explain. So unfortunately, we are going, I'm, I'm, I'm being recorded. Yeah? If, other, otherwise, I would go into some speculations. Yeah? But I, that's a bit too dangerous to be recorded. And, and, uh, because you could, I could speculate, for example, what happens if the degree is, is not three, but four and five. And, and, uh, but perhaps we can switch off the machine and you can ask questions. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and then there are some more speculations about the connection with, uh, with uh, matrix factorizations, and which is, in fact, the tool that uh, my colleagues and I used while we were preparing this geometric work we were doing computations on the computer uh, uh, using matrix factorizations, which helped, helped our moral because this, we, for a long time, it was not, I mean, finally the picture is very simple, but the beginning, I mean, we had, to, we, this was not so, not so obvious what was going on. And by doing calculations with matrix factorization, we knew from the very beginning that the, mod, that the tension space was eight dimensional and symplectic in every point, even in the most degenerate point for the matrix factorization, it was eight dimensional symplectic. So this was some of the moral uh, background that, uh, that we needed to, to carry out the work. In the end, in the paper, the word matrix factorization shows not up, does not show up, uh, but uh, somehow 
I think that it might be, at least for these hypersurfaces, might be the right context to do it, to do it uh, appropriately. And, and um, once you have reached this level, then actually we could drop the notion of a curve completely, because if you take this point of view, there's no reason to talk about curves. Yeah, I mean, this, this is something about the derived category of Korean sheaves. So you could fix any type of topological data, say, in, in, in some, any element in K-theory, and carry out that construction. The problem is why we work with curves is that we have, with curves, we have some control about the geometry. If you just take a sheaf on a, on a cubic fourfold, what do you want to say? I mean, there's, it's almost impossible to get your hands on the geometry and to do anything. And, and so that's the only reason why we work with curves. Otherwise, we could, uh, could take uh, coherent sheaves as, as, as well. And, but this is for the moment uh, um, out, 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 out of view. And my hope that it will be, we will get a more direct, uh, um, direct approach to it by, by, by investigating matrix factorizations uh, in more detail and, and make that connection precise. And this is one of the projects that I have in mind and I can quietly work here without being disturbed by too many students at home. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Thomas? I have once again, yeah. So, I don't understand the connection between the curve picture, which is yes. a kind of walk down, and yeah. the derived category picture. I mean, you're saying there's abstractly some equivalence. Yeah, I mean, here, what, what you, for example, here you do the following. You, so for, just to give you this, this, this map here. You start with the, uh, um, with the ideal sheaf of the curve in Y. This is more or less the same thing as giving the curve. Yeah, because there's a unique, I mean, uh, even the abst I mean, with an ideal sheaf, you always have to be careful when people say ideal sheaf, they always think of the sheaf as being a subsheaf. Yeah? So, but here there's no difference. If you have this ideal sheaf or the ideal sheaf as an abstract sheaf or as a subsheaf, it's the same thing. However, if you, if you, if you now re say, I, I said that uh, the, the curve S generates a three dimensional, uh, uh, so this is a P3. If I intersect this P3 with Y, I get a cubic surface. So this is not, uh, that's a different S, so sorry, um, let's say sigma. Yeah? So I get a, a cubic surface. And uh, so I can consider this also as a subset, as an ideal shift of C as being considered in the cubic surface. And I can consider this still as being a coherent shift on Y. Now, the interesting thing is that, of course, starting from this, I easily get down here, but the way there's no way back. And the reason is that this curve has many embeddings into, into the structure sheaf. Yeah, this thing has, has co-dimension three, but this thing has co-dimension one. So there's, not a, there's a linear system in general of possible embeddings. So here there's, there's a difference between the notion of the sheaf and the, of course for a smooth surface this will be a line bundle. Yeah? And it's a linear system in the, in the real sense of the word. Yeah? But even if this is very singular, both of them can be very singular, then there will always be a P2 of possible embedding. And, and, and again, I mean, so, so for example, if you, have, uh, if you, if you take a curve which, is, which, which looks like this, yeah, with this embedded point here, then, uh, then we get the following, I hope I get this right now. So I have the curve, I have the embedded point, and here I get the reduced curve. Yeah? But now keep in mind the reduced curve is a complete intersection. And the complete intersection is of such a type that when you apply the projection here, then this will completely disappear. Because this has a resolution which involves only these three line bundles. So if I, if I do a projection which gets, gets rid of these three line bundles, it means that, more, I mean, there's a, there, I mean, first of all, the line bundles, they take twists. I mean, I'm, I'm very not imprecise here. But the basic point is that this sheaf under the projection gets ignored, it becomes zero. This means that if you project down into this, into this category, then the curve and the point have the same information. And that is the reason why for this divisor, all the information gets lost except for the information on the, on the, on the embedded point. 
Yeah, so, so here geometrically you, you, you do this construction actually, which we do using using arguments from Mori theory. I mean, we, we have we have construction arguments and and uh, checking checking uh, intersection numbers and so on. So so we so like in the middleman model program. I mean, we we just verify that the construction exists. In this interpretation, this has a very precise meaning, namely. It, it identifies C with P because the difference between them is, a sh is information that is, is, is uh, projected out by the left mutations in, in, uh, in the derived category. So you claim that uh, A, Y is nothing but uh, the derived category of Z? A, Y, the subcategory A, Y is uh, isomorphic to I mean, these are semi-stable objects in A Y. So, so this is a kind of modulized space of semi-stable objects in A Y for some, for some uh, semi-stability for some stability condition on the derived category on on A Y. The problem is that so far we have no theory for that. So we are we are lacking we are lacking projective, we are lacking constructions to to to, to associate abstractly. To a stability condition and, and projective moduli space. And how, I mean, do, how do you get? How how do you prove that uh, Z so, is deformation equivalent to Q? Ah, ah. Well, this is a uh, Addington calls it a quick and dirty proof. Yeah. So the, so the, the the so it's a bit of it's a bit of cheating proof. Yeah. So it's uh, so what we do, what we do is the following. Um, so uh, keep. Think of why we are in the Pfaffian situation, case now. We have Y and we have we have S. Then over this, there's a certain incidence scheme. Uh, let me call it gamma, which is uh, is, is four to one. So is, I think I, I, I aha, let me see whether I can still recognize, uh, re reconstruct it. So this this uh, here we can we can write this as as being uh, uh, forms. So let me think. So this, this, so a point here is a two-dimensional subspace in U, and and uh, here I have a form on on Y which is which is whose radical is two-dimensional because it has rank four, so it has a kernel and the kernel is two-dimensional. So this one, so each of these two uh, represents a plane in some sense, and then I can impose the condition that this intersect. Uh, that the, these two planes are non, have a non-trivial intersection. This is the definition of this gamma. So the gamma is, is the space of all pairs such that the corresponding two planes intersect. Yeah? And th this gives us a kind of incidence variety in this, and this will be the Mukai kernel for a certain Fourier Mukai pair uh, transformation on, from, from gamma to S. And this one is, is four to one. So, and uh, as, I, as, I, as I told you, I mean, because of this procedure here, I mean, a curve of this type is more or less the same thing as a point. So let, let me ignore details for the moment. Yes? So this means that if I, if I do now the, 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 the fourier mukai transformation here, using, using the ideal sheaf of gamma as a kernel, I can, I can... Yeah, let me do it very naively. So what basically happens is I have a point here, then the pre-image is four points, I push them forward, there are four points. Yeah? So what happens in the neighboring fibers? So the point is, in the neighboring fibers, there are other sheaves, there are other complexes. But now we have a kind of semi-stability argument. If you have complexes, and for some point um, under, the, under, the, um, uh, under this transformation, the image is a sheaf, then in open neighborhood, it will also be a sheaf. And if the, if the image sheaf is an ideal sheaf, then in open neighborhood, the image complex will also be an ideal sheaf. So, so in some sense, if we, if, we have, we, if we have our moduli space set, and here we have the Lagrangian subvariety Y, then in a, in a neighborhood of this, the image will be in the Hilbert scheme. So that's by the, what I mean by, by quick, yeah? And, and, and because we do not analyze what happens outside Y. We only analyze what happens on Y. And on Y, we get a well-defined map into the Hilbert scheme using semi-stability arguments for, for, uh, for cohomology, I mean, for, for this 
Bukai tra uh, transform, then uh, uh, we conclude that it, that it also on an open neighborhood maps into the into the into the Hilbert scheme, and then uh, then we are done. Yeah, then we have a birational map by comparing the uh, comparing the dimensions of the tension spaces. They are of the same dimension and everything, and that's fine. So it's it's a bit. Um, yeah, we are lazy. We do not analyze anything what is going on outside outside Y. And I think Kuznetsov has started at the same time a more detailed research, and perhaps he will be. Actually, it's not excluded. Could be that it's actually isomorphic. Yeah, but our method does not show it. Other method, our method only shows it's it's uh, birational, because we have no control about what's going on here. And I, I believe that that Kuznetsov can be perhaps show. That it's that it's something much stronger yeah, is is true. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Let's stop. Let, let, let's stop.